So let's go ahead. And... Great, thank you. Thank you for the recording here. So we've started the recording. Um, I'm going to introduce Sarah. I'm really excited about um, her presentation today and having her join us. Uh, she serves as the Chief Behavioral Health Officer at Communa Care Health Centers, the largest FQHC in Yolo County. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist and licensed professional clinical counselor. She's provided direct service and administrative services in the field of addiction and mental health since 2003 in multiple mil milieu, including detox, intensive outpatient, interdisciplinary pain management, dual diagnosis, integrated health, and perinatal day treatment. As the Chief Behavioral Health Officer, Sarah oversees an over 110 member team who provides services in multiple service locations, including multiple clinic sites, school sites, the juvenile detention facility, along with services co-located with county services and other community-based service providers. She serves on the NAMI YOLO Board of Directors and is appointed to the Department of Healthcare Services Behavioral Health Stakeholder Advisory Committee and is the current chair of one of our state roundtable um, members, the California Primary Care Association's Behavioral Health Work Group. In addition, our Delta team has the privilege of engaging with Sarah regularly as a member of our Learning Lab co-design work group as a voice for the provider in this group. So with that, Sarah, we'll turn it over and we know you're gonna take over the slides from here. Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen here. Okay, all right, great. Um, again, I'm Sarah Gavin. I'm the Chief Behavioral Health Officer at Community Care Health Centers. And before we start talking about one of my, really my favorite topics to discuss around integration, because it's really about patient care and improving outcomes for the clients that we serve and uh, system navigation, I just wanted to share some context about the work that we're doing at Communicare uh, because it's pretty unique as an FQHC and uh, that we're providing the full continuum of mental health uh, and substance use treatment at Communicare. So that's, we're a drug medical provider, a specialty mental health provider for kids uh, and adults, as well as providing the mild to moderate uh, continuum of care. So mul multiple opportunities for integration, including with our criminal justice partners, and we're co-located in a number of locations, including schools throughout the county. So there's lots of opportunity for integration. And today we're going to be focusing much more on uh, mental health and substance use, I mean, excuse me, mental health and primary care integration. So I, I wanted to start with this question because this is a question that gets asked all the time uh, for agencies, are your services integrated? Um, and there's usually a yes or no answer, and sometimes you'll get evaluated and you'll have to check yes or no. And I really want to provide context to the conversation that we're going to have and the information I'm going to present that I really want us to back away from this thinking of a yes or no, because integration is something that we can always deepen and we can always go back and forward. Um, just like as we improve our skills in communication or relationships, we don't ever say, that's it, I made the finish line in terms of communication or, or relationships. We continue to work at it and it's an iterative process. And we can sometimes go back, right? We can have a change of providers or change of locations or things like a global pandemic that can completely change the course of how integrative care is provided. So I really want us all to be kind with ourselves and I'll talk through some of the models of integration and realize that there is no finish line or gold star in the way that I view this. This is always something we're working at uh, together. And, and why? So I, I do want to say first that integration is really hard. And there are so many times over the, I've been with Communicare for 14 years now, and there's so many times that people have come into my office and closed the door and said, this is really hard uh, and feeling frustrated. And so as we talk through some of the problems that happen and some of the beautiful things that happen, I do think it's important to start with the why. Why are we putting so much effort into integrated care? Uh, and, and we know, and I'm sharing just a few examples of it, that um, 50 to 70% of the clients coming into um, primary care centers are really needing to be treated uh, in a mental health, uh, with a mental health interve intervention. And so 
it's really the de facto treatment for P primary care is a de facto treatment for individuals that are really needing mental health services. So if we're really looking at better patient outcomes, we need to have those services available. We need to have access and integration um, so that clients are able to to navigate those systems. We, we talk a lot about stigma and mental health and substance use treatment and having services integrated is a destigmatized approach to healthcare. It's saying as a part of your health care that you're getting with us, we will treat and support all of the needs you have. We're not saying if you have a mental health condition or you have a substance use um, disorder that you have to go to a separate facility or you have to go somewhere else because we don't treat those conditions. We're saying this is all part of wellness and healthcare. And that means something to the clients that are receiving services. So that increased equity in care, access to care, decreasing stigma. And something I just wanted to highlight that doesn't come up a lot in terms of uh, the benefits of integrated care is provider satisfaction. So we know that retention uh, and recruitment of primary care providers is extremely important. And I often hear our primary care team say that the reason that they're coming here and staying is because of integrated behavioral health and access to integrated behavioral health because they feel a lot less frustrated and they're able to do the work that their license <laughs> allows them to do and focus on that um, and really get better outcomes from the patients that they serve. So lots of good reasons, many more than are on this slide. I wanted to share that with you. And, and recognizing that our systems are extremely complicated. If you've ever had to navigate a mental health or substance use um, services for yourself or your family members, it's extremely complicated. And I share this, this is a picture that my husband took when I was in Iceland and we were asking for directions and this, we were uh, navigated to the sign. Nothing on the sign had anything to do with what I had asked for. And it was a well-intended you know, help, but it, it is a reminder of when we're working in the system, we know the acronyms, we know the workarounds, but when you're accessing a system that you're not familiar with, um, you need a little bit more help and care along the way to get you there. And so I was just doing a, a recently a presentation on integration and, and, and someone shared that we need, when looking at this picture, we need uh, healthcare travel agents. That's what we need in all our healthcare systems and thinking about how we navigate. I thought that was great and wonderful. Uh, I wanna walk you through some models of integration because People are at different stages of integration uh, and what they're, look, what they're kind of striving for and looking towards. And so on the left here, we have coordinated care and this is the continuum. So coordinated care is like, you're, you know who to call if you have to make a referral, you might have coordinators that do that, that, you know, that navigate the referrals to mental health or substance use. And so you have a system in place that you're able to understand who to refer to and how to refer to. Uh, moving to the right, even better is co-location of services. So that's services where under the same roof, they're together, they, the agency is overseeing two different disciplines of services like primary care and mental health, and, and we're together doing the same work. Full integration, clinical integration is not that we're just seated together or that we're working under the same roof, but that we're actually working together um, with the same treatment plan, the same, uh, the same clients, that there's a collaboration that's happening with, um, with the same treatment goals as part of the co-location integrated care. And then system integration is really things that we don't have direct control over, but it's how our system above us is getting integrated. So how, you know, right now we have a trifurcated system where we have specialty mental health and substance use and primary care and uh, mild to moderate. Um, and so it's all separate and separate funding streams. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but in a, in a dream integration world, all of that would be also integrated so that when it trickles down to the provider level, uh, we can do the work a little bit more seamlessly. And an example of co-location and coordinated care, this is our, I wanted to share with you, this is our fam, uh, Hanson Family Health Center, which is actually where I am right now. And these are, this is the variety of services that we offer under this roof that I'm in right now. So this is, so someone can walk into the door and get access to all of these services, full continuum of um, mental health, primary care, dental, uh, medication assisted treatment, drug medical, multiple outpatient substance use programs. Uh, and that's wonderful. Like that's wonderful. Clients can walk in and, and, you know, we live, you know, we work in a small community and people can walk through the doors and they don't know whether they're visiting their dentist or they're visiting their, uh, you know, substance use provider. It doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. They're getting the care that they need, but, but all of these systems still have 
different doors. When you open the door, there's a different way of operations. There's different staff. There's different methods of billing. There's different compliance. There's different data that we have to track as, you know, as relates to our funders. So this is really the jump between co-location integrated care and then that, um, and that full integration that I was just discussing where the dream would be that there would be truly one door uh, and it would be the operations and the payment would all be integrated in a way that can be uh, navigated seamlessly for our clients. So I'm gonna ask you, um, I don't know if, you know if anyone brave wants to unmute and or you could chat in, but I, I want to ask you to look at these two images. And just because uh, I'm a therapist, and I know that we project our own, um, our own meaning onto image. I just want to say this is a picture from years ago of my father, my daughter, and then these are my kids when they were much younger. And so that's what they're pictures of. But I want you to look at both of these images um, as and, and, and if, you, if you could just take a few moments, you can chat it in, you can unmute. What do you see the difference is between these two images? What do you notice? Hi, uh, this is Jill. I'm looking at the right picture, kind of like they are sharing the two sisters, they're sharing the same material, same book. Mm -hmm. This is on the other one where they everyone focused on their own uh, business in this case. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for sharing. Exactly. So as sort of a metaphor and as a visual to, to leave with you around integration, the left, it's they're definitely co-located, right? They're actually very friendly and touching but they're reading out of different books. They're having a different experience and responding to something independently still. And on the right, my daughters are reading out of the same book and co-located. They're sharing the same experience. They can talk about the same thing. And so this is really a visual to, to, um, to demonstrate the jump between co-location and true integration. What we hope in true integration is that we're all reading out of the same book. We're talking about the same things. We have different perspectives, different expertise to share, but we're looking at the same book. Thank you for sharing that. And so doing that is not easy. And I want to, I think, you know, early on, I, I definitely was naive in making the assumption that everyone is just, it's all going to work out seamlessly. When we started doing integrated uh, behavioral health here at the health center, it felt like it was really going to be easy. And, and I think it's important to acknowledge, acknowledge that it is a merging of two cultures, that primary care and behavioral health have different education, experience, philosophy to care sometimes. Uh, there's different operations that happen in primary care and behavioral health that have to be negotiated and talked through. I'm acknowledging that there's a power differential. If you work with behavioral health providers, or you are behavioral health providers, often there's a feeling like the primary care physician is here and the, and the behavioral health uh, clinician is there. And so acknowledging that power differential and working through that and, and talking about it in any ways that you can level some of that is important. Uh, there's different data that we're focusing on and tracking the data is different. Um, so looking at how behavioral health can focus on the data we need and primary care can focus on the data they're, they need and create an efficient structure is challenging. And we could talk through that a little bit at the Q&A. The billing is different, the charting is different and the communication style is different. So it was, it was a joke when we started integrating that there was like a discussion around that behavioral health needs to use more bullet points and emails because it was too lengthy because primary care was communicating in one sentence and it's really the culture of like, there's no time. And, you know, behavioral health was doing lots of flowery emails. And so even things like that, that feel minor, it's an opportunity to, to, to talk where people are coming from and, and come to a place of that's going to be most helpful. And it's the same thing around reading notes. And um, we just had a conversation today from a primary care provider, so, you know, trying to understand the behavioral health notes and where they could just get the information that they need. And it's just a constant negotiation that's happening. Um, I want to share some real examples of uh, things that I've heard from primary care over the years. And this is over the years, and this is not meaning at all to be disparaging against primary care. I'm going to do behavioral health in a second, but to acknowledge that these are real things that come up and around integration, and also that there are opportunities for us to talk through and learn and understand each other's perspective a bit more. So one was, why are you here? When a provider walks into an exam room and sees a behavioral health clinician in the exam room, don't know if this is an experience that anyone else has had. And so having to talk, not in that moment, but later on about why are we here? This is when we first started integrating and explaining. Um, sometimes we, at this point, um, 
um, we're so integrated that we sometimes we go in oftentimes before the primary care provider even gets there to talk through some things. And that was a big shift that was happening. My patient is crying. So this was something we heard a lot when we started integrating, which was every time a patient cried, they would get behavioral health. And so talking through about the difference between someone showing an appropriate, you know, response, like an emotional response versus someone having a mental health crisis and, you know, where that line is all negotiated. I don't think my patients have those kinds of issues. So this came up when we were implementing medication assisted treatment. I don't think that that is occurring. And so we had to share data and get provider champions and talk about actually it is, we're just not asking the right questions. And so again, just a negotiation and discussion. Can't the county see them? So this came up early on about, well, isn't the county providing mental health services and why are we doing it here? And so again, more opportunity for relationship building and education. There's no time for that. I need to get, I don't, you know, in primary care clinics, it's fast moving. We don't have time to talk about this. We have to move on. So it's part of the operations that we were working through is how we can move through the, so that we don't stall an exam room, um, but still take the time and care for our patients that we need. No one's available for a warm handoff anyway. So this is about, you know, hiring. And if, you know, if they go through the process of initiating a warm handoff, which I hope you all saw that kind of two minute warm handoff video um, we sent that, the, you know, as an illustration for what a warm handoff looks like, um, having no one available is frustrating, right? When you're finally doing it and talking to a patient, a patient does want to talk to someone not having someone there. Why do I need an LCSW to diagnose depression? Um, so this comes up around, you know, providers that for years have been managing mental health in their practice and not having integrated behavioral health. So this is an opportunity to discuss how behavioral health can complement what they're doing uh, and, and support them. I don't have time. So that's a big part that comes up in primary care. Conversely, in behavioral health, I hear, you know, I've heard over the years, primary care doesn't spend enough time with them. Um, they don't listen. They don't respond to my calls. Um, they don't understand patient choice. So we just had even a conversation about what that looks like around trauma-informed care. And my favorite, we aren't magic. So something that comes up, which is that primary care will often um, refer um, to behavioral health for all sorts of things and often things that we can't necessarily solve. And my philosophy is I never want to create uh, strict criteria for warm handoffs. I want them to continue to over refer and we can work it out because once you start um, putting too strict of criteria in, in primary care, then you start restricting um, times in which we could support a warm handoff. So I, and I talked to our, our integrated behavioral health team all the time about this. I said, I am going to continue to want them to refer even if they expect us to do magic because that helps the flow, that helps people relationship build, that helps build trust. Like we just need to continue to have it happen. Um, they think they're in charge of me. So that's around the power differential of, you know, who's mm -hmm. in charge versus a leveling relationship that we're working again, two people reading mm -hmm. out of the same book together. One's not reading the other to the other one. Um, they told the patient to see me, but didn't say why. So that's, um, you know, in that warm handoff video that you all saw that, you know, walking into the room and if a patient said, I'm not really sure why you're here. And, you know, so we were talking through just getting permission from the patient if they're going to make a direct referral. Otherwise, we're now popping in and just introducing ourselves as part of the, the care team and saying, you know, not necessarily a referral was made, but we just want to let you know that it's available as part of your health care and, um, and we're here to help if you ever want to talk to anybody. So those are just a few examples. Um, I'm hoping that you relate to some of them. And so these are just some of the best practices in terms of what's worked. And you know, there's been a lot of lessons learned over the years, but location really matters. So we have a site, uh, we did a little experiment where we had a site where the, the integrated behavioral health provider was right next to the nurse's station and then compared to a site where uh, she was down the hall. And it, we had doubled the warm handoffs from the person that was in the nurse's station. So proximity really matters, which I know is limited by facility and, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things that make that limiting, but it really, really matters in that moment when the provider, when the primary care provider sees the behavioral health clinician, it matters. It makes them be aware and go, oh, I need to talk to you about something. It also creates relationships. Uh, I, I don't think we spend enough time um, working on relationships. We spend a lot of time in integration and crisis together. And so it's usually like a crisis situation is happening, which is not the best times to build relationships, but any way that there can be team building across departments or any way that people can get to know each other as a person, uh, the 
the uh, integrated behavioral health clinicians that have relationships, and I mean like relationship, real relationships with the providers, they're more likely to refer. We have sometimes, you know, clinicians that get referred to all the time, and it's just because they have a relationship with that provider. So really that can't be said enough. And then multiple ways that there could be peer advocates and navigators that help kind of bridge the gap between the two, um, two departments is really important. Uh, power leveling. So any way that behavioral health and primary care can be seen at the same level so that there isn't this sense of one is sort of more in charge than the other, the better. That sometimes comes from uh, leadership org charts and thinking about who reports to who and being mindful and intentional about that. Um, it could start there. Uh, and having and having champions, that's a big, you know, if you, ha we have some providers over the years that just had such great uh, experiences with integration. And I just really encouraging them, can you share that story at the next provider meeting? Can you share it with an email? Can I share it out with people? Um, because we need champions. We need people that are really invested in this work and see how it impacts patient care to really be able to talk to other providers in doing that. So anyway, we can elevate examples of integrated care working um, and how we help people. That would be great. And then of course, everything starts with leadership vision of how, it, how invested is leadership in integration and power leveling. And so I just wanted to share some examples um, of what in, some of our integrated care programs look like. And we have many, and as I mentioned, we're embedded in lots of different places over the county with different models, but just some, some models that we have. Um, in our integrated behavioral health uh, site, we have multiple LCSWs at each site to provide care, including our dental site, um, and then navigation to specialty mental health. And then we have embedded behavioral health clinicians that only focus on warm handoffs and screening. So they aren't necessary, so they're available all the time. And we look at this as kind of like a, a model where sometimes a primary care provider goes into an exam room with the uh, mental health clinician just to introduce, just to acknowledge that we're part of the care team together to destigmatize accessing mental health. So it's not just like, oh, if you said yes to this questionnaire, you then need to go see this person, um, but really just making them available and aware that this is, you know, this is there. We have um, substance use screening also at each site uh, uh, for the whole county in terms of accessing uh, drug medic health services. Um, and then now we started with our ACEs Aware grant to add patient navigators to do some education and navigation around the relationship between toxic stress and health outcomes. And so there's lots of ways that we've sort of uh, built up a robust behavioral health uh, integrated program. And we still have lessons learned. We still have, you know, things that we step back on, but most of our primary care sites is well, well staffed with lots and lots of support. And just sharing one other program, which is our Transitions of Care program, which is also focused on integration, but specifically individuals who are leaving incarceration or hospitalization and getting them connected with all of the services that, are, that a health center has to offer. And so this is a really important area to bridge. There's a lot of, of individuals leaving incarceration that don't have stabilizing services and don't have a navigator and someone to walk um, them through the path of how to get connected with primary care and behavioral health and substance use treatment. And so uh, this team is able to do that and, and support them. And, and this team is also embedded in primary care um, to also help outcomes for individuals who have um, pretty complex uh, physical health outcomes as a result of long-term incarceration, like uh, pr in the prison system specifically. So it's an enhanced benefit for individuals that have been incarcerated for a really long time and are, and are sick. Uh, and so it's also helping them get their ongoing care. As I mentioned, there's lots of, you know, pivots that have to happen, you know, in integration and COVID was definitely one of them. And so I just wanted to just spend a few minutes talking briefly about some of our um, adjustments that we had to make in terms of COVID and telehealth. And so we really took the model that all clinicians and staff will be trained in telehealth when this happened. So some of the, we continue to do lots of in person services as well and create this as an option for clients. Um, but we also really said we want everybody trained in being able to do this, um, even if you're not doing it now. Uh, this helped to create more access. So I know psychiatry access, for example, has been a challenge for years. And now we have much better child and adult psychiatry access because 
You don't have to travel, uh, you know, 40 minutes across our county to see a psychiatrist at a site that has access. And so that's been really wonderful. So we've been really focusing on the areas that have access challenges to do that. Um, we do video and phone. Uh, we are doing some innovative work around, we have a mobile med program and we do, we are partnering on Project Room Key to do quite a bit of services in with the unhoused and in motels. And so we've been using laptops and tablets to bring in other providers that it would be more efficient to do it that way than them going around. So we have, uh, we've been providing that for like medication assisted treatment consults and uh, integrated behavioral health consults. And it's a nice way to just connect with providers if we need it. And then if they have to go out, then we, we you know, on the phone, we can make that determination, have them go out. Um, one of our uh, sites is a, a for the unhoused, uh, it's a respite site. And so we often use telehealth around nursing consults, especially during COVID when we were at the beginning kind of um, talking through symptoms and um, that was really helpful and it really was efficient uh, in the ways that we were using it. And then we also use it for group and family visits. So we, we provide uh, child and family team meetings. And so being able to get for families and specialty mental health, so being able to get everybody together at one time, like child, you know, uh, child welfare services and family and all that, you know, it's been a really, really wonderful uh, way to lift some of the barriers in, in people accessing care. So there's lots of technology is challenging and it, it really is impacts integration because ideally we'd all be in the same room together all the time, but there's also ways that we've been able to work around that, which has been a lot of, which has been because of the wonderful relationships we've had developed, which is foundational. Um, so I think we're going to wait on questions for the Q&A. So I'll get back and- Sure, we actually, thank you so much, Sarah. This was sure. fabulous. So you probably have questions that you started Great. thinking about and we will take those to the breakout room. So let's go ahead and um, bring the slide deck back up uh, regarding our breakout rooms. Um, and so I'll tee this up for you. We've got um, two breakout rooms. Uh, one is uh, for integration of behavioral health and uh, care integration. Uh, as you can see there, PC and behavioral health integration. So kind of more